signal? Are we up and running? Okay. Uh, certainly glad that everybody's here. Uh, those who are joining us online, we're happy that uh, you're able to join us as well. In just a minute, uh, Adam Blackston is going to lead us in a prayer. I do want to mention Lynn's surgery Monday went well. He said he didn't see the doctor afterwards, so he figured everything went well. I texted him yesterday, and he texted back, and he sent a text this morning, about, not about how he was doing, but I'm, I'm assuming everything is uh, doing as, as well as possible. But let's remember uh, him in our prayers, uh, as well as others that we know of who are struggling with their health. All right, Alan, if you'll lead us in a prayer, please. Let's pray. We're grateful, Father, for all that you give us each day, our homes, everything that we have to have a normal living uh, life. We're so grateful for those things. Father, we pray that you'll be with those of our number that are ill. We pray that they can uh, get better and be with the caregivers and can be back with us soon. Father, please forgive us of our sins and be with us in this study this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, what we're going to do is uh, there's some questions we're going to answer, and we'll talk about Jephthah, and then we'll get to chapter 13 concerning Samson here in just a few minutes. So let's go back. Uh, question six, one of, not really a judge, but he, he made himself king and became a leader, Abimelech. It says, after Abimelech died, who arose? Tola arose from the tribe of Issachar to save Israel. He lived in Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim and judged Israel 23 years. And, and we're just not told a lot about him. Then you have Jer. Jer the Gileadite arose and judged Israel for 22 years. He had 30 sons and they had 30 cities in the land of Gilead, Jer, Jer, or Jer, was buried in Cam, Camon, Camon. All right. Oppressed by the Ammonites and Philistines when Israel cried out, the Lord told them to cry. All right. Cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you. And then we have a section in your words. What do we learn from the account of Jephthah's rash vow? How might we account the Lord's admonition in Luke 14? <clears throat> if, if you read Luke 14, 25 through 33, what, what, is the, what is that text about? I'll just reveal it. What about if we follow Jesus? What has to be true of us? Verse 26, uh, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, and children, brothers, and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So the point is, uh, there's a commitment that we make in serving the Lord. Uh, so the question is, what do we learn from the account of Jephthah's rash vow? And, and in relation to what Luke 14, 25, 33 teaches, what are some things that we learn about Jephthah's rash vow? Okay, uh, one thing is, be ready, for, looking at Luke 14, be ready to give up whatever, anything, everything. What else can we learn from his vow? We, we talked about some of this Sunday morning. Yeah, we need to be careful what we say. We need to think carefully before we speak. Can you think of other lessons that we might learn? You know, and, and we didn't look at it, but it says it in the book, and it says probably maybe the, the greatest or most significant, I don't know exactly the wording that was used, the thing, something that Jephthah said was, I cannot go back on what I've said. All right, I'm going to flip on through there. When the, when the nation realized God had refused their pleas, how did the tribes respond? This is number nine, and this is on page 37. What did they do? All right. They began putting away the strange gods and turned to the Lord. And we talked about that Sunday morning. 
Jephthah vowed to dedicate to the Lord whatever came from the house first and to offer a burnt sacrifice to God. When Jephthah arrived home, his daughter and only, only daughter, his daughter and only child came out to meet him. Jephthah said, I have opened my mouth and I cannot go back. <clears throat> Here is the, the end of the, uh, the last thing in the, in the lesson. I thought I'm just going to move it up here since it's, we're talking about Jephthah. Some suppose God required Jephthah to sacrifice his daughter's life to remain faithful to his vow. This should make for a lively discussion, but can we know for certain what Jephthah did? Let's just go back and let's look uh, in chapter 12. <clears throat> I want to want to begin with verse 29, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, chapter 12, verse 29. The Bible says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead he advanced toward the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them. Now I want us to drop on down. Uh, let's look at verse 34. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me. For I've given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. So she said to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Then she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months, that I may go and wander on the mountains, and bewail my virginity, my friends and I. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains, and it was so at the end of two months that she returned to her father and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. <clears throat> Here's what we know for sure. Jephthah carried out the vow that he made to the Lord. The Bible tells us that. I guess what what is under consideration is what was that vow that he made? Uh, one of the things that was said, and I, I don't have it before us, but if you read, it, it talks about a scholarly, uh, let me back up and find it. Oh, it uses the word scholarly in here. Oh, a scholarly examination of these passages suggests that Jephthah, this is at the middle of page 35, knowing God's importance of human sacrifice, never intended to make, an hu human sac make a human sacrifice, but rather a burnt offering suitable to God. Then he goes on and he says, the latter part of verse 31 should read, I will offer him, that is the Lord, a burnt offering rather than I will offer it for a burnt offering. Jephthah vowed to dedicate to the Lord whatever came from the house first and to offer a burnt offering to God. Uh, as I read, and I, I, I acknowledge not being scholarly, okay? So uh, all I can do is read, read what the Bible says and try to learn from others as well. <clears throat> and and I, I, I'll have to say this. I looked at about eight or ten different translations just to see if I might get a difference in some. Uh, in, in verse 31 where he refers to, I will offer to him a burnt offering. Uh, he suggests that that's the way the original reads. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not disputing that. I just couldn't find that. I, I was reading commentaries and had a commentary that referred to Adam Clark, who is a, another man who wrote a commentary years ago and said that he rearranged the Hebrew for it to read that way. 
And again, I'm not disputing what uh, Mike McLemore is saying here. I'm just saying I did not find it. Let's, 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 talk, let's talk this way. What are some things that are said that might make you think he offered his daughter as a burnt sacrifice? Pardon? Okay, that's what he said he would do. He said, he says, whatever, let's see, whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up as a burnt, sac a burnt offering. And, and we're going to look at the other side too. What are some other things that might cause you to think that he offered his daughter as a burnt offering? Okay, she was in, she was in mourning, and, and, and there's, there's another comment we can make when we talk about this other side. She was in mourning. What else? Where, where, what did he say he was going to offer? That which came from his house first. Now, maybe he was expecting, uh, you, if you couldn't see, if he was expecting a servant, that still would be a human sacrifice. If he was expecting an animal, I don't know. Maybe they had animals in their house. I don't know. Uh, it seems to me that if you're whatever comes from my house, it would indicate a, a person. I'm just trying to give one side, and we're going to go to the other side here in just a minute. And then we know he did what he said he would do. And let's talk about the other side. What are some things that would lend you to think that he did not mean his daughter? That's right. Human sacrifice is not acceptable to God, that's for sure. Yes, he was. It didn't happen. For him to go do that. That's, I, I hadn't really thought about that, but that's exactly right. Uh, what are some other reasons that might make you think that he didn't, uh, he, he wasn't talking about his daughter? Right. All right. Uh, we know that uh, one of the reasons she was, you know, you can, you can automatically think the reason she was sad, and you think about uh, Jephthah. He sees his daughter, and, oh. and, yeah, and now the question is, was it because she no longer would be able to have children and his lineage would no longer carry on, which was very important in the Israelite nation, in the Israelite world? She was mourning. Was she mourning because she would have no child? It does say there in verse uh, 39, she knew no man. Now, one of the things it says there in, in verse 40 that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah. What were they lamenting? If she's still living, what are they lamenting? The fact that she ha can't have children? <clears throat> I mean, I'm just... You know, I, I would have said before uh, I started reading all this stuff, I know what I've always thought, but that doesn't mean it's right. Uh, so here, can we know for certain what Jephthah did is the question. It seems like that. Uh, Just reading straight from the scripture, it, le it l lends or it leads me to think that she was sacrificed. Now, I'm not positive that's right because 
I know, I know that God abhorred human sacrifice, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean somebody didn't do that. But one of the things, too, in verse 29, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and then he goes on and he makes this vow. Uh, you know, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, did that take away his, his ability to choose and reason on his own? I don't believe so. Again, I'm just trying to throw things out. In, in, so since we're all satisfied with what he did, <clears throat> he made a vow and he kept his vow. I mean, I, that's that's one of the things that we can say. And and I, you know, I don't mind saying I have always thought that he offered his daughter. That may not be correct, Al. <clears throat> that that's 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 another. Another thing the book says, I believe about verse 32, he was listed as among the faithful. Does that mean he never sinned? See, it doesn't mean that. It means that he was faithful and, and he was faithful and was recognized as being faithful. And, and there, there's something else to consider. Uh, so, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is, except he offered a vow, and the Bible said he kept the vow. She did. She said, go ahead and you do it. Uh, she said, go ahead and do what you've done. And, and again, uh, it's just, and, and I did spend time trying to, to look and study and see what the different uh, translations said and, and try to find where, where, I almost called Mike to ask him, where, where, where you you, you find that it, it means him to offer to him in verse 31. And, and I just couldn't find it. That just mean, may mean that I, I just didn't look where I needed to. But anyway, okay, so we're going uh, we're gonna, to we're gonna move on now to Samson. Samson becomes a judge. Who, uh, who is the, the enemy that is raised up against the children of Israel? The Philistines. Chapter 13 begins the same way. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. What was Samson's father's name? I believe that's where he was from. Unless I read it wrong. Man Man Manoah. Uh, what family or tribe was he from? The tribe of Dan, and it's, it's, it's verse 3, the angel of the Lord appeared. And, and that angel of the Lord appears in, in 3 and 9 and 13 and 16, twice in 17 and 18, in 20 and 21, twice. And so what I know from that is the angel of the Lord plays an important part in the events that unfold. He appears to <clears throat> Samson's mother. What is her name? If you can answer this question, you can answer that first one. What is Noah's wife's name? Mrs. Noah. What is Manoah's wife's name? Mrs. Manoah. I couldn't find that either. It doesn't tell us. At least I couldn't find where it told us. But she was told by the angel of the Lord that he was going to be raised as a what? A Nazarite. And there, there was a vow that went, went with that. And what, uh, what was she not to do as well as her son? Not. Th thank you. <laughs> that's right. She, yeah, that's right. She was not, she was not to, to drink. Uh, let me get back here. Wine or similar drink. What were they not to eat? Anything unclean? And what was to happen to his hair? A razor was not to come upon it. So here's, here's, part, here's the Nazarite vow. And she, uh, being the mother, would have to observe this as well. Well, this, the man of God comes, or this, this angel of the Lord comes, and she runs to her husband, Manoah, and she says, here, here, here's what he told me. And so she relays to him, what she told him. What did it? Okay, other than that, that's what he told her. Uh, you're going to have a son. And so Manoah, 
in verse 7 says, Behold, you shall, well, no, the, Behold, you shall conceive this is what the angel of the Lord said. Manoah, verse 8, prayed to the Lord and said, O oh, my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. And God listened. And what happened? Verse 9, verse 10. She's sitting in the field, and the angel of God appears to her again. She runs in her tells, she tells her husband, he has come again, just like he did before. And so he goes with her. Verse 11, he says, are you the man who spoke to this woman? He said, I am. Manoah said, let, now let your words, verse 12, come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life in the work? And he repeats, you have to be careful. Not to drink any wine or strong drink, not to eat anything unclean, razors not to come upon his hair, all that I commanded her, let her observe. And so Manoah, Manoah he says what? Hold on, stay with us, let's detain you. And what, what did he say he was going to do? He's going to prepare a goat, he's going to prepare unleavened bread, and we're going to offer a burnt offering. And, and what did the, what did the uh, angel of the Lord say? If you prepare an offering, be sure to prepare it for the prepare it for the Lord. He asked for his name, Manoah does. Verse 18, what did the angel of the Lord say? He says, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? He takes the young goat, he takes the grain offering, he offers it on the rock, and what happens? I'm going to tell you what, that'd get your attention, wouldn't it? The angel of the Lord ascends out of sight in the flame. And what, is, what does Manoah say? We have seen, he says, we've seen God. We're going to die. But his wife says, no, 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 no. Uh, if the Lord was going to kill us, why would he allow us to offer this burnt sacrifice, this burnt offering from our hands? And show us all of these things. So verse 24 says, So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed them. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahana, Dan, between Zoar, Zorah, and Eshtael. Well, by this time, we come to chapter 14, and Samson apparently is a grown man. What is he wanting? He wants a wife. And they go down to Timna. He sees a woman that he likes. She is from where? Or she is a Philistine. And he says, get her for me as a wife. Tells his mother and daddy that. And what do they try to, they try to reason with him. What do they say? Now, can't you find one uh, like us? Yeah, here, you're going to marry this uncircumcised Philistine and it goes on and it says verse 8 well let me get, let me get to verse 3 again but Samson said to his father get her for me for she pleases me well verse 4 says but his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord and the Philistines at that time of course we were told are dominating they're ruling over Israel so, so Samson goes down to Timnah with his father and mother. He comes to the vineyard, and he comes across this young lion. And this young lion is coming at him, and it says in, in verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And what did he do? He just with his hands tore him apart. They go down and talk to the woman, verse 7. She pleases Samson. Verse 8 says, after some time, when he returned to get her, what did he see? The carcass of that line and what was in that carcass of that line. Here was bees and honey in that, honey in that, and a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass. He takes some, he gives some to his mother and father, but he doesn't, tell them that he'd taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. 
So they go down to, to the woman. Samson gives a feast, and it says for young men used to do so. How long did this feast last? It was a seven-day feast. Samson gives a riddle, and he says there in verse 12, if you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. But if you cannot explain to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments, 30 changes of clover and clothing. And they said to him, pose your riddle that we may hear it. So here was his riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Three days they could not explain it. So who did they turn to? On the seventh day, who did they turn to? His wife. What did they say? You can get it out of him. You, you entice him, and you be sure you, you, you tell us what this riddle is or what's going to happen. Going to burn you and your father. I, let me tell you, they just took, it was not justice, they just took things into the hand. You do this or we're going to kill you. And so she pleads with her husband. Uh, she weeps in his presence. Verse 17 says, now she had wept on him seven days while their feast lasted. And it happened on the seventh day that he told her because she pressed him so much. What might we say? She just nagged him and aggravated him to the point he just said, I've got to tell her. I can't take it anymore. Never been there. I'm serious. I've never been there. Not for seven days. I'd leave the house for a day or two. And he was giving a feast. Uh, and so she, he explains the riddle. And the men come, verse uh, 18, and they say, we've got the answer. What is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lie? And he said, if you hadn't been with my heifer, who was he referring to? His wife. So men, there's your scriptural authority to refer to your wife. I have a good friend, and that's what he did. He'd refer to his wife that he loved. He said, I want you all to meet my heifer. Uh, and he knew, but, but he said, it's scriptural. You know what? He never went to intensive care, and they're still married because she had a sense of humor, and he did too. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you do that, but that's what Samson did. Verse 19, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. He goes down to Ashkelon, and what does he do? Kills 30 of their men, takes their apparel, and gave the changes of clothes to those who'd explained the riddle. His anger was aroused, and verse 20 says, and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. Uh, was that Samson's idea? Doesn't seem to be, does it? When you get to chapter 15, now it's, wheat, it's the time of wheat harvest. Samson goes to visit his wife with a young goat. He says to her father, let me go in to my wife. And, but the father said, well, he wouldn't permit him. And he goes on, he says, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her, therefore I gave her to your companion. That's not funny. Uh, but he just gave Samson's wife away to his companion. And Samson didn't take fondly to that, did he? He said, whatever I do, the Philistine's going to be on you. So what did he do? He caught, and I don't know how he caught him. I don't know if he just went out and started. I don't know what he did. I know he caught how many? 300 fox. He ties their tails together. He puts a torch between each tail. Now, again, I don't know how he has these animals corralled. And then he lights the torch and he turns them loose in the fields and what does what happens? Just burns everything up. Just burns everything up. And they want to know who did this, and they were told who did this. Uh, the son in law of the Timnite, verse six. And so the Philistines did what? They ended up being burned anyway, didn't he? His his daughter and his wife. And Samson said, I will take, I will surely take revenge on you after 
that I will see. So he attacked them with a great slaughter, hip and thigh. Then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Edom. So the Philistines are encamping in Judah. And, and the men of Judah are asking, why, why have you come up against me? And, and what did they say? Who are we, who did they say they were after? We're after Samson. Uh, we, we know that he's hiding here in uh, the cleft of the rock of Edom. Verse 11 says that 3,000 men of Judah go down, they come to Samson, and they say, we've come to arrest you. And what did Samson ask them at the end of verse 12? Just don't kill me. You don't kill me. So they bound him with new ropes, brought him from the rock. Verse 14 says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and what happened to the ropes? He just broke them like there was nothing there. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand, and killed how many men? Killed a thousand men. Samson said, verse 16, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. He threw the jawbone down. He was thirsty. He asked the Lord, and the Lord had water come from the hollow place. He split the hollow place. And the end of that chapter says he judged Israel 20 years. So he had a wife from Timnath. You get to chapter 16, he goes down to, to Gaza or Gaza. He finds a harlot there. He's with her. They surround him. Uh, and Samson, he, he kind of takes his easy till midnight. And what does he do at midnight? Takes hold of the door of the gates of the city. Hmm. He just lifts it all up and he walks away. And then we're told in verse 4, here's a, a third woman. After what happened, that he, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek. And she's probably the one that remember, the one that is most remembered. Her name was Delilah. And so here the Philistines, the, their leaders come and they're, they're asking her, you and Tyson find out where his great strength is and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah, she begins to do that. Uh, what, what, what causes you to have such great strength? And what does he say there in verse 7? Bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dry. And so they did. And they are surrounding him, and she says to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson, but he just breaks the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks. Verse 11, she asks again, please tell me what you, what you may be bound with. And so he says, this time, buy me securely with new ropes that have never been used. So she does. Thereupon, him, what does he do? He breaks those loose. And she says, you're just mocking me, Samson. So he tells her a third thing at the end of uh, verse 13. If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, she weaves it. She says, there upon you, he awakes, pulls out the batten and the web from the, the, the loom. The, what, the loom. And then she said, verse 15, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have told me where your great strength lies. And I have to read verse 16. And it came to pass when she, the New King James Version says, pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. So you might have a different word that is translated instead of pressed. No, excuse me. Uh, instead of pestered. When she pestered him. Pressed, okay. All right. And so again, he was just at the point of, I, I, I give up. Uh, and so he tells her, if I'm shaven, I'll lose my strength. And so she lulls him to sleep on, his, on her knees. She calls for a man. They shave off the seven locks. Then she says, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep. But at the end of verse 20, it says, but he did not know 
that the Lord had departed from him. So the Philistines take him, and what do they do? Punch it, poke out his eyes. That kind of puts you at a disadvantage, doesn't it? Matter of fact, you, you see the kind of disadvantage. As you go on through the chapter in verse 23, they're gathered together, and they're offering this great sacrifice to their god, Dagon, uh, because they're celebrating the fact that that God that they serve delivered Samson into their hands. Uh, they call for Samson, verse 25, to perform for him. He, he performs for him. Verse 26, how did Samson get, along, get around? He had to be led around. It says a lad led him around. And Samson asked the lad to do what? He is below the, the, the porch. And where did he want him to be positioned? You get me between the pillars and I'm going to reach out and feel one and I'm going to feel the other. It says there were about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. The end of verse 25. Samson Praise to God. He says, strengthen me. Just this once, O God, verse 29, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. It says he took hold of the two middle, middle pillars which support the temple. He braced himself against one on the right and one on the other. And he pushed with all his might. The temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. And how many did he kill? That's right. Killed more in his death than he did in his life. So his brothers came. They took his body. They bury him between Zorah and Eshtael in the tomb of their father Manoah. He judged Israel 20 years. Well, that gets us through all the judges that we read about here in the book of Judges. Chapter 17, Micah's idolatry. Where is he from according to verse 1? The mountains of Ephraim, his name is Micah. What had he done with some money that belonged to his mother? He had stolen it and he gave it back. And what did she say? Okay. Okay. Uh, his mother said, may you be blessed by, by the Lord, my son. So when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver, his mother's mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. So he takes it to a silversmith, 200 shekels of silver, and he makes a carved image and a molded image. Verse 5 says, Micah had a shrine. He made an ephod and household idols, and he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king of Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And I've got that highlighted, underlined, and starred. There's a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the, of, of the family of Judah. He was a Levite. He leaves. He goes to the mountain of Ephraim. He comes to the house of Micah. Micah asks him, from where did you come? He says, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm on my way to find a place to stay. And Micah says to him, what? You stay here and you be a father to me and you be my priest. And, and what did he say? Say he would give him if he would do that. Ten shekels of silver a year, a suit of clothes, and sustenance. So the Levite was content to dwell with a man. He became like one of his sons. Now let me ask you this. What was that Levite's name? I don't know. It's just interesting that here you have people that play really an important role, but the, the Lord didn't see fit through the Spirit to reveal that to us. You come to chapter 18, and we, we, we see concerning uh, the tribe of Dan. Verse 18, chapter 18, verse 1, In those days there was no king in Israel. And what was Dan still trying to do, the tribe of Dan? They were seeking out their inheritance. They, as of yet, had not uh, 
gotten their inheritance to dwell in. And so they send out five men and they tell them to go spy out the territory. You remember us reading about that earlier when they're capturing the land and there's seven tribes still left and they're told you go up and you, you survey the land. You go, you go seek out the land. And, and they come across whose house? They come across Micah's house. And this, the voice, they, they recognize the voice of this young Levite. And they want to know, why are you here? What are you doing in this place? What brought you here? What do you have here? And he said, well, here's what Micah has done for me. I've become his priest. He's hired me. And they wanted him to inquire of God whether they should go. And what did he say? The Lord be with you. So verse 7, they departed and they went to Laish, L-A-I-S-H. They saw the people. They were very quiet and peaceful people. There was no ruler to rule over them. They were uh, in a quiet and they felt secure. They had no ties with anybody, so the spies go back and they say what? We found our spot. And so verse 11 says, 600 men of the family of the Danites went from there from Zorah and as they all armed with weapons of war. They pass through the mountains of Ephraim. They come to the house of Micah. And what proposition do they make Micah? I wonder if it appealed to his pride any. You can be the, the priest over a house or you can be a priest over a tribe of people. Well, he liked that idea. So what did they do with what was in the house of Micah? They gathered all that, I'm going to call it paraphernalia, idolatry, uh, worship, worshiping items. They take it with them. They're going down the road and Micah comes with a company of people and they overtake the children of Dan. And at the end of verse 23, here's what is said to Micah. What ails you that you have gathered such a company? And his response in verse 24, you have taken away my gods which I made and the priest you have gone away. Now what more do I have? How can you say to me what ails you? And basically, what do, what do the children of Dan tell him? You need to go back and be quiet or you're going to lose your life. And he sees that they're too strong and he goes back to his house. Verse 27, through the end of the chapter, they settled, the tribe of Dan settles in Laish uh, because there was no deliver for the people there. They rebuilt, they burned the city, but they rebuilt the city. And they dwelt there and they called the name of the, of the city Dan. It was formerly Laish. And verse 30 says, Then the children of Israel set up for themselves the carved image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests of the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. I just, I'm just going to ask and remind us what did God tell them not to do? Don't serve other gods. And we just see that happening time and time again. Chapter 19 uh, starts out, it came to pass in those when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite. It doesn't tell us his name either. He takes, he's from Ephraim. He takes a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But it says his concubine played the harlot against him. Uh, four whole months passed. Then her husband, the Levite, rose and went after her to speak kind to her. And so he comes in and he sees his father-in-law. His father-in-law detains him for three days. They eat and they drink. He gets up on the fourth day, verse 5. He gets up early in the morning. He's ready to depart. But the father-in-law says, refresh your heart with a morsel of bread. Afterward, go your way. They sit down. He says, be content to stay all night and let your heart be merry. And so he lodged there again. And then verse 8, the fifth day. Basically, they go through the same thing. But this time, 
Verse 10 says, the man was not willing to spend that night, so he rose and departed and came opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. He had two saddled donkeys, his conc and his concubine was with him. They're near Jerusalem. The day is over. Verse 12 says, we will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. Gibeah was a part of what tribe? It'd be Benjamin. And we'll see that uh, later on as we get to the war in chapter 20. They get to, well, actually it says that in verse 14. They, they're, they're relaxing. Actually, they're in the square, and an old man comes in, and he sees them, and he says, why are you here? And he tells them, he said, well, I'm too. I'm from Ephraim. You come and you dwell with us. And, and the Levite says, well, we've got food for animals and for ourselves. You won't have to do anything. But the Levite, I mean, but the old man said what? I'll take care of everything. It would be my responsibility to take care of you. And so they're in his house, and this reminds me of something else, and you'll, I'll ask you, and you know who, what's, what it is. Uh, and there's a knock on the door, and there are wicked men. Who do they want? Send out the Levite. Why? They were homosexuals. That's what they were. Who did that happen to early? It happened a lot. And the man said, no, I'm not going to. Uh, and, and he says some, something similar to what Lot says. Lot says, I'll send out my daughter. And uh, the Levite says, I'll send out my concubine. And they ravage her, and she falls down at the, uh, the door. When he gets out in the morning, he says, get up, let's go. She's not able to go. Why? She's dead. And so he throws her over his donkey. He gets home, and what does he do? He cuts her into 12 pieces and he sends the, the pieces out throughout uh, Israel. Well, the children of Israel, chapter 20 says, they came out from Dan to Beersheba as well from the land of Gilead. Congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord. They have four 100,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword in verse 3. And they said, what happened? And the Levite, he tells them what happened. And so they make a vow. Number one, they will get none of our women for wives. And number two, we're going to go set this thing straight. And so they approach Benjamin. Uh, let, me, let me back up to verse 8. None of us will go to his tent, nor will any turn back to his house, but now this is the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We'll take ten men out of every hundred, hundred out of every thousand, thousand out of every ten, to make provision for the people that when they come to Gibeah and Benjamin, they may repay all the violence that they have done in Israel. Verse 12, the tribe of Israel sent men throughout all the tribes of Benjamin, saying, deliver up the perverted men so that we can remove this evil from Israel. But they wouldn't listen. Instead, they gathered their people together and they were ready to go to war. <clears throat> Verse 15, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword. Besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who numbered 700 select men, what about these 700 select men? They were left-handed. And they not only were left-handed, they knew how to use a sling. It says, uh, everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth, breadth and not miss. You know, the odds seem kind of uneven. <clears throat> and it happens to work out for those who have the greater odds because why? God was with them. You know, I, numbers make no difference. Gideon took 300. God was with him, and he, he was able to come out victorious. They say, who goes up first to fight? Who's, who's the Lord say go up first? Verse 18. Judah goes up. So they go out the first day, and what happens according to verse 21? 
How many is children of Israel are killed? 22,000. That's, that's quite a few. They weep before the Lord in the evening. They ask counsel. The Lord says, go up again. So verse 24, they go up again. On the second day, how many are cut down the children of Israel on that day? 18,000. They, they weep. They fast. The end of verse 28, the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. And they set up an ambush. And now the third day, they go to battle. And what, what do the children of Israel do who are approaching? They back up like they had done before. Like, and and what, what does the Benjamites think? We've got them on the run, just like we've had them on the run before. It says about 30 men of Israel were killed that day, 31. They are defeated before us at first. Let us flee, the children of Israel say. But what happened when they pulled them out? Verse 33, toward the end, then Israel's men in ambush burst forth from their position in the plain of Geba. Or Geba. Ten thousand select men from all Israel came against Gibeah. The battle was fierce. The Benjamites did not know that disaster was upon them. The Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel. And the children of Israel destroyed that day 25,000 hundred, excuse me, 100 Benjamites. All those, all these drew the sword. So they saw that they were defeated. Once they pull them away, they rush into the city. They strike the city. They set the city on fire. The cloud goes up and that's the smoke and that's the signal for the others to turn back. Uh, verse 41 says, when the men of Israel turned back, the men of Benjamin panicked for they saw that disaster had come upon them. Verse 44, 18,000 men of Benjamin fell. All these were men of valor. Then they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimmon, and they cut down 5,000 of them on the highways. Then they pursued them relentlessly up to get them and killed 2,000 of them. So all who fell of Benjamin that day were 25,000 men who drew the sword. All these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimmon. And that's, that's important because when you come to Chapter 21, the men of Israel say, we have sworn that nobody, we will not give our daughters to Benjamite as a wife. But what did they realize that was going to cause? The tribe of Benjamin would be wiped out, wouldn't it? And so they came up with a plan. <clears throat> Verse 10. So the congregation sent out there 12,000 of their most valiant men and commanded them, saying, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead. Who were they to kill? Women and children. Who were they to save? The young virgins. Verse 12 said there was 400 young virgins. They brought them to the camp at Shiloh. They gave them. They called uh, Benjamin back. They gave them the women whom they had saved alive. Yet that wasn't enough. And so there, here's another plan. Verse 19, in fact, there's a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebanon. Lie in wait in the vineyards. Watch when the daughters of Shiloh come out to perform their dancing, and then come from among your vineyards. Every man catch a wife for himself from the daughters of Shiloh. I'm going to step over here. I mean, this was the plan, and that's what they did. They, they did this yearly until they were able to have enough wives uh, so that their tribe could be continued. The, the, the chapter ends by saying, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And again, I have that highlighted, underlined, and starred. <clears throat> As a Nazarite, Samson was not allowed to what? Drink wine or 
strong drink or eat any unclean thing or to cut his hair. <clears throat> List three occasions in which Samson violated his service as a Nazarite. All right, eating honey out of the carcass of the lion because a dead, dead animal's what? Was unclean. What else? What else do y'all have? Okay, he, he, that's the third one. He cut his hair. What else? Yeah, uh, at the feast, he, he likely drank strong drinks. So there's three times. Yeah. Yes, sir. One more thing. Okay. Touch anything dead, a man dead, unclean. That's it. That's, it. That's an excellent point. There you go. That's exactly right. Thank you. Uh, match the scripture reference. There was a couple of faux pas in this. Uh, dedicated a Nazarite from birth. What passage? D, Judges 13, 5. Of course, that was Samson. Ate honey from a lion carcass he killed with his bare hands. I, Judges 14, 5 through 9, that was Samson also. Regulations of Nazarite valor given. That's G back at number 6, 2 through 21. Samson gave a feast in Timnah where wine was likely served. I have B as in boy, Judges 14, 10 through 20. Delilah called a man to cut Samson's hair. K. Judges 16, 19, Samson became a slave to the Philistines. C, Judges 16, 21, Philistines. That should be Philistines burned his fiance and father. I think the book says Samson, but the Philistines burned his fiance and her father. H, Judges 15, 6, he killed 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. J, Judges 15, 14 through 15, he escaped from Gezer or Gaza carrying the gates to the op mountain opposite Hebron. E, Judges 16.3, Samson demolished the temple of Dagon. That is A, Judges 16, 29 and 30. Samson is buried in his father's tomb. Uh, judges F, Judges 16.13. And by the way, uh, K had in our book Judges 16.9. That should be 19. If you, you looked, you probably caught that. Okay, anarchy, we see that, the final five chapters. Samson was the tribe of Dan. Samson insisted his father will get a woman for him of the Philistines, losing both his power and his eyesight. Samson was imprisoned, became an object of ridicule. Class discussion. Discuss the implication and consequences of the Lord's charge that Samson must be a Nazarite from his mother's womb. Let's, let's, let's talk about a consequence. When he violated uh, that Nazarite vow and having his hair cut, what did he lose? He lost his power. He lost his strength. Uh, as long as he did what he was instructed to do, and I don't, there may be more involved in it than that, but uh, it says, further discuss Samson's parents' indulgence in areas that were clearly in conflict with the Nazarite vow. Uh, you know, they should have said, son, no. But what are we told? They didn't realize that the Lord was using this to bring about, uh, raise up someone who was going to begin to defeat the Philistines. A matter for review. Identify three events in history, Israelite history which could confirm God's abhorrence of human sacrifice. I, I'm going to tell you what I did. Uh, Numbers 12, Leviticus 20, 2 Kings 16, Psalm 106, they all talk about uh, human sacrifices and the fact that the Lord abhors such. You may, you may have had something different. Okay, Lord willing, next week we're going to study the book of Ruth. There are four chapters. I think we'll be able to get through those Sunday morning and Wednesday night without having to uh, maybe feel, feel rushed, although I, I like the pace we're going at as long as everybody gets an opportunity to speak up and 
and say what you would like to say. Does anybody have any comments before we close tonight? Thank you for your being here. Thank you for your participation. Let's, let's offer a prayer to God. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Uh, thank you that we have it so that we can read and understand and know your will. Help us to learn the lessons from the Old Testament so that uh, we can know how you have dealt with mankind and how you continue to deal with mankind and that you will hold us responsible. But you are a loving, merciful God and you will forgive us when we sin, when we turn from it. Be with those who are unable to be here. Bless each one. Forgive us, Father. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.